Hi, this is Dustin Hausner. I'm the Jewish Outreach and Program Director at the Wayne YMCA. All our Jewish programs is funded through the Federation of uh, Northern New Jersey. So I'm really feel very fortunate today to talk to someone who's really making a difference in New Jersey. He is the Executive Director of Garden State Quality. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Christian uh, Puscarino. Uh, Christian, it's really nice to have you on today. Dustin, thank you so much for having me on. It's so, good to see you. It's wonderful to see you. So it looks like you're in proper attire today for, uh, for the interview. So equality, very good message. Yeah, I've been, I've been rocking a t-shirt since early March. Um, and I had to put on a hat more recently just because the hair was getting a little out of control. I'm thinking about uh, shaving it and cleaning everything up for Pride Month. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, if, if, if this is how we are communicating to stay safe and social distance, then uh, I'm going to take full advantage of that and not have to wear a suit. Because uh, for those uh, for those of you who are, are have seen me out in the public, I wear a suit every day. So this has been quite the treat, and I'm living it up. Well, I'm I'm very glad, and I certainly want to talk to you about uh, Pride Month, which is of course right around the corner. But um, before we begin, for anyone who's unfamiliar with Garden State Quality, can you just tell us a little bit about the organization and how it was founded, what it does? So we'd love to hear a little bit more about it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Garden State Equality is New Jersey's LGBTQ organization. Um, we've been around for about 15 years. We originally started as a marriage equality organization, uh, like many others uh, across the country in many states. Um, and since then, uh, we've been able to pass over 250 laws. Um, and we have grown out programming to help those in our community live, have, uh, live full equality, or as we, we've been saying, uh, that, so that they can live equality. Um, and so some of that programming looks like older adults work. Uh, a lot of times we see folks in our community have spent their entire lives fighting for the rights that we enjoy today. And then they move into an older adult facility and they face abuse and they need to go back into the closet. And so we believe that no one should ever have to go back into the closet, especially after spending a lifetime fighting for the rights that so many of us enjoy. And so our programming there is going into these facilities and doing sensitivity trainings. This work is more of our recent work and uh, our older work uh, as far as timeline is the work that we've been doing in schools, anti-bullying programs. And Garden State Equality at the time was able to pass one of the most comprehensive anti-bullying policies in the nation. Um, and today we're still pretty aggressive about keeping kids safe in school, which is why uh, we're the second in the nation to be teaching LGBTQ inclusive curriculum. Amazing. And uh, the first in the nation to be teaching curriculum across all relevant subject areas, not just uh, history like California does. Um, had to put that in there because we are a little competitive when it comes to equality. We want folks in our state uh, to have it as good as it can get. And we're, we're, we're doing a pretty good job of that. One other program I just want to mention because it's so important, especially uh, at a time when healthcare has come to the forefront of so many conversations and that is our work that uh, we do in uh, the, the healthcare system here in New Jersey, it, it, primarily working with uh, uh, care physicians and hospital systems. And that's doing trainings there so that uh, our providers have a better understanding of what uh, LGBTQ health means and how to serve LGBTQ patients. Uh, we've been really grateful to have the partnership of RWJ Barnabas in Somerset uh, spearhead this initiative with us and and they did go ahead and open up the first full circle I don't know if you can hear my cat eating right next to my ear here, but, <laughs> I can hear a little um, bit of scratching in the back, yeah, the back. she she's, uh, hasn't ate all day and now she's hungry so um, <laughs> that's the crunching going on down there um, yeah, the, the RWJ Barnabas in Somerset, they opened up the first uh, full-service LGBTQ health clinic, which is now called the Bab Sipperstein uh, LGBTQ Health Center. And a lot of other hospitals and systems throughout the state have been begun work uh, incorporating LGBTQ health into their services. I mean, to say the very least, that all sounds absolutely amazing. The fact that not only are you doing work with, you know, obviously laws, but also between the seniors, the bullying, the healthcare. I mean, it's just a large variety of different tasks to do. So, I mean, you know, kudos to you and your team for all that work. 
I definitely want to dive in a little bit more on the programs, but I am curious because unfortunately many people I would say don't know a lot about LGBTQ history, especially in the US. Many people don't know the word Stonewall and that's about it. So I'm curious um, from obviously being a New Jersey organization, you said you, you know, about 15 years ago, the organization was founded and I believe you're in um, Asbury Park, if I recall, which I think has a significance that not many people know about. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what was the catalyst for the organization being formed and a little bit about the history, um, if, you, if you don't mind. Sure, uh, our offices are in Asbury Park, but we are a statewide uh, organization in all uh, 21 counties. Um, we're in Asbury Park because it it's, uh, has a very large LGBTQ population. It's, if you want to get technical, it's actually the largest population of LGBTQ couples in the state. Um, for those in North Jersey watching, um, to clarify, Maplewood is the largest population of LGBTQ families in the state. Okay. Um, and then for all my single folks watching uh, in uh, Hudson County, uh, that's where the largest population of LGBTQ singles uh, is in New Jersey. Oh, wow. I like to put Asbury Park, though, uh, kind of like uh, I categorize it as the, the P-town of New Jersey, hmm. um, the more uh, developed Fire Island of New Jersey, <laughs> the Rehoboth of New Jersey. So like I kind of put it on that level. I'd like to think that there's a lot of that culture that exists in this town. We have a, a deputy mayor who's openly LGBTQ, a large population. Um, there's many LGBTQ organizations in Asbury Park, not just Garden State Equality that is headquartered there, but there's um, a community center focused on uh, social services. There's a, a community center focused on hom homelessness and HIV and AIDS. There's uh, health groups, and in fact, the um, the state's only um, federally funded LGBTQ health center is in Asbury Park. Mm. And so that's why when we were thinking about our new home a few years ago, uh, we were so attracted to having settling down in Asbury Park and being there. Um, the organization, as I mentioned earlier, is 15 years old. During marriage equality, we had a, a sub office in Asbury. Um, and I think that uh, it meant a lot to the people that lived in the community locally. Mm. And so despite us still being in all 21 counties, doing our programming all throughout the state, we do like to call Asbury Park our home. Uh, well, that's absolutely wonderful. And it's nice to hear there's such a diversity of different communities in Asbury Park. And clearly you have the knowledge of knowing where to shout out to the different parts of New Jersey. So there's a great love in your voice when you talk about it, which is a beautiful thing. So um, what I'd like to- uh, Yeah, um, please. if we, if we, I'm sorry. No, no, go, go ahead. We, no, there's a little lag. Like, I wanted to, <laughs> please go ahead. There was, there was a little lag there, I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, but it, if we could have an office in all 21 counties, we would, I, I honestly have to say, one of the best parts about uh, leading this organization is connecting with people all over our state. So all the way down to Atlantic and Cape May County, Camden County, all the way up to you know Bergen, Hudson, uh, Essex, uh, and then centrally as well. Um, every county ha typically has uh, uh, a, t a city that is highly populated with the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's so many prides throughout our state. Uh, and I know that's something that we're gonna talk about. Yeah. Um, but uh, most counties, they have their own prides locally because they're, this is a state of 9 million people. We're very densely populated. And so the reality is most people don't wanna drive over 30 minutes to an event, right. which means uh, if you spent, spread 9 million people over 21 counties, mm -hmm. uh, position that state between uh, Philadelphia and New York City, yeah. both cities with large LGBTQ populations, you're gonna find a lot of LGBTQ people in New Jersey um, and so that is one of the things I enjoy most about uh, leading this organization is no matter where you are in the state, you're going to find a lot of queer folks. Mm -hmm. So let me dive in a little bit, because obviously if we had spoken a year ago about what your plans were for Pride for this year and your programs, it would have been a very different conversation. Unfortunately, with uh, you know, the coronavirus um, still taking place, even though states are slowly opening up. You know, organizations like yours have had to very much adapt to it. So I would love to kind of hear from you of how your organization has been adapting both with its programs, which sound extremely important, but also 
with Pride Month coming up of how you're able to either do services or what are safe ways to be able to celebrate at this time? Yeah, safety is a priority for uh, all of the Pride organizations that I've come in contact with. Um, Pride is going to look very different this year uh, from uh, NYC Pride, who uh, has canceled for the first time. Um, or not canceled, but they're bringing it on virtually. Um, to uh, Jersey Pride, our, our larger Pride Festival, which is about 30 to 40,000 people every year, to all the smaller Prides. Everyone's doing something virtually thus far, which I think is great. Um, we did talk about uniting for one Pride out of all the New Jersey organizations. Mm -hmm. But as I was mentioning before, the local community is so important in a state like New Jersey. Yeah. And so um, folks might be familiar, especially watching with uh, on this uh, live stream, um, Maplewood Pride, which is essentially North Jersey Pride, or even um, Jersey City Pride in, in, in uh, Hudson County. Yeah. Um, these wow. these uh, are prides that attract thousands of people every year, but they partner with local businesses. And so they're hoping to highlight those local businesses, the small businesses that are really hurting the most right now, yeah. um, to say thank you and to let them know that they're still part of the pride uh, celebration, even though it's not happening in the physical space. So um, Jersey Pride in Asbury Park, um, we're actually going to do a live stream event with them on June 7th, which was originally the Jersey Pride date uh, set. Okay. And we'll be highlighting local artists, um, artists that are uh, experiencing a lot of um, hardship right now with not being able to perform to uh, elected officials speaking, community leaders, and that's going to be on June 7th. Uh, if folks want to tune in, the date, uh, the time will be announced within the coming week. Perfect. So, I mean, that sounds like, a, obviously, it's not quite the same as what has been done previously, but to honor these artists and obviously have different officials speak, at least is a different way of being able to recognize the month. So um, I'm curious in regards to some of your programming in the sense of, you know, you had mentioned some of the senior work, you especially the anti-bullying, which sadly these days seems to be an extremely focused and prevalent issue. And obviously healthcare, you know, I mean, we could have a whole conversation about that and the injustices. So I'm curious with the coronavirus, have you found ways to adapt and change those programs up or because in part school is closed, there's, you have a bit of leeway time to kind of figure out, regroup, and then, you know, hopefully present something in the next few months. Yeah, um, we've moved, all right, we're really fortunate to have a strong program team um, that moved very quickly to bring programming online into, di into the digital space. That looks a little different for each programming and, and I'll highlight uh, some of that now, but um, for uh, our, our safe schools programming, the, the curriculum work which was rolling out in our pilot schools right now is very difficult because we were um, collecting uh, feedback on how that was working in the pilot schools and obviously when they all went to online teaching, um, the data changed on how to figure out if uh, you know, like what's working well, and what's not. Mm -hmm. um, we're in, in contact with all the educators involved with the program though, so that um, if, if teaching is in fact online in the fall, um, fall of 2020, that these lessons can be taught uh, virtually just as any other lessons. Because really LGBTQ uh, curriculum is just an infusion of regular lessons. Um, lessons, when I say regular, I mean lessons that are already being taught. Um, and so uh, we also found that a lot of schools are already teaching LGBTQ inclusive curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, 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 when schools are talking about James Baldwin, they're also talking about uh, his sexuality and, and partners that he had in life. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really not that different from what most schools have been teaching. It's just more guidance in in helping educators bring a fuller story to the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been received really well in the schools that we've been piloting. So uh, for the sake of, of, of being selfish and wanting to see how this works in schools this fall, I hope that we do have in-person training, uh, in-person in teaching 
um, so that we can see this uh, going at 100% capacity. Um, so that's what we've done for our curriculum work. Um, as far as our, our bullying programs, we are still here as a resource to young people. And we're finding that young people, especially in unsupportive homes, are going through a really difficult time right now. Mm. Um, and, and we continue to be a resource for them. Um, and a lot of other organizations in the state are also providing support groups that these young people can participate in. Mm. Unfortunately, uh, the, the worst of times sometimes brings out even the worst in people. Mm. Um, and we have seen some uh, young people being kicked out of their homes because uh, their parents have found out that their child is LGBTQ. Um, you know, there's this, there's this uh, image that goes around on social media every few months that um, I, I never understand how a parent would feel um, raising an LGBTQ child as if th th that th you can't understand how a parent views raising an LGBTQ child as a failure, disowning your child as, as a failure. Mm -hmm. um, and so to see a parent kicking their child out at a time when there's not even you know, safe places for them to go in a world that's isolating, that's, that's failure right there, that's disappointing. Um, all I can hope is that the younger person is in a safer place by not being in that environment. Um, and so we've done everything that we can to connect them to resources that exist um, so that they can uh, find housing and, and stay safe. Um, then our, our health and wellness work, um, for, for, those, for those of you watching uh, who haven't uh, fallen asleep at this point, uh, You're doing our, health and <laughs> our health and wellness work is, has become very relevant right now, as you can imagine. Um, um, and we're constantly talking with providers and ensuring that um, the LGBTQ community is receiving the care that they need because uh, unfortunately the LGBTQ community is, is uh, uh, experiencing higher rates of COVID-19. Mm. It's in large part because of um, the increased tobacco use among LGBTQ people. Um, and so when, when I talk about this, um, we're, we're, we're going based on what we know about LGBTQ health. We're not going based on um, real data. And so real data is SOGI data, sexual orientation and gender identity um, that's being collected or that should be collected um, in COVID testing. And that will give us a better idea of what the rates are among LGBTQ people. And so we're working quickly with the state right now to implement that kind of data collection, which of course is optional. Um, and we're also working on a piece of legislation um, that will help address uh, the uh, unknown related to COVID, but also um, in, in, in health in general, making sure that this data is collected. We know pe people based on uh, their race, their ethnicity, their gender, their age, but we don't know based on their sexual orientation and gender identity. And so that's important information. Think of it like this. If this is a pandemic mm -hmm. um, that is largely impacting one population over the other. Mm -hmm. It's really important that we know that so we know where to guide resources um, and funding. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about New Jersey as a whole right now. I know, uh, uh, you know, folks maybe outside of the state are watching this as well, but mm -hmm. um, we have 9 million people in the state of New Jersey. If we have $9 million set aside in COVID-19 response, and we're just gonna spread it over all 9 million people, that's only a dollar per person. Mm. But if we know that COVID has the highest rates among women of color or uh, uh, women of color who um, uh, uh, identify as lesbian, then we can take that $9 million and focus it more, which will have a larger impact on the community that is actually being affected by COVID-19. Now, I do just wanna say that COVID-19 affects everybody. We've seen in the papers, we've seen in the stories that everyone uh, is, 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 is uh, vulnerable to COVID-19. But it's possible that it's had, having a larger impact on certain communities. And we wanna make sure that the communities that are most affected by this receive the proper resources so that it can be addressed uh, more quickly and eradicated before it spreads to the general public.
Hmm. No, I'm just, to me, it's astounding because while it makes sense, everything you're saying, the idea that there is this uh, methodology that isn't being utilized to help track this that could be so helpful for your state and others, it, it's quite astonishing. But I'm, I'm glad to hear that sounds like there's legislation potentially to do with this and you, your organization, as well as, as well as others, are trying to figure out the best practices for tracking this stuff down. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that at least. So there is uh, some positive. But yeah. Dustin, um, this isn't like, you know, Garden State Equality employees were sitting around a table and said, let's just collect data um, on our community. This is, this is the recommendation from public health experts. This is a recommendation from national medical um, institutions. Uh, and so we are leaning on what science is saying. We are leaning on what medical professionals are saying. We are leaning on what public health experts are saying. And then we're getting to work and trying to make that a reality so that we can collect that data. So I just want to be clear that this is very science-based. This is not just uh, the a statewide organization deciding this is what needs to be done. We're going off of, of experts. And so for anyone who's kind of like on, on edge about collecting that kind of data, um, this, is, this is recommended nationally by experts. Um, and so we want to make sure that our community is counted uh, and if this, uh, uh, if this um, virus uh, is affecting our community more, we need to make sure that we can address that. So I just wanted to clarify that this is uh, us just deciding uh, one day that SOGI data matters. This is based off of uh, decades of research and determined by uh, experts. No, I'm extremely glad that you chose to clarify with some more information. Um, I think with any of these, I want people to be educated on whatever we're discussing and obviously equality when it comes to New Jersey as well as all over the country is an extremely important issue. So, you know, I'm very glad that you were able to provide some of them. That this is backed up, of course, by health scientists and you're doing what is necessary because it is necessary at this time. So let me ask you, because again, we mentioned a little bit about Pride. We talked a little bit about your programming. So for a person watching this, whether it is someone who is you know a young member of LGBTQ or an older member of LGBTQ, if you could talk a little bit about what you would want them to take away from, you know, about garden state equality or just in general, you know, the LGBTQ communities in New Jersey. Because I think as you've shown, especially earlier on, you know, there is a great connection in a lot of the different communities. The organizations work together, there's different places where families are, couples are, it sounds like a very multifaceted place for people of the LGBTQ community. So I know it's a very wide question that I'm asking. So maybe the way I'll break it down is um, simply, what would you want people to know about Garden State Equality for anyone who's unfamiliar? And when it comes to LGBTQ issues, you know, about New Jersey in general? Mm. So, um, Prior to um, starting at Garden State Equality, I um, worked in uh, essentially the, the, the Jewish social justice space. Um, I was at Ben the Ark, uh, a Jewish partnership for justice. And then after that, I was at Educational Alliance, which is essentially a 129 year old settlement house uh, with 18 locations in New York City now. One of the locations is the 14th Street Y. And what I learned working for these organizations, uh, and I, 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 rec I understand that's, that why is a different why from the, uh, the one that uh, you work with, but um, what I learned working at these organizations is that the Jewish community has adopted values of servicing others, so serving others. So a lot of the social justice issues had really nothing to do with the Jewish population most of the time. It had to do with being Jews doing good in the world. And so when I came out of that space to Garden State Equality in a post-marriage equality country, hmm. I was thinking about what are the values that this community is going to adopt now that we are reaching newer levels of equality, now that we have more rights than we have had before. And so I really try to guide this organization with a values mindset and thinking about 
who we are as a people and what contribution do we want to leave on society. Now, that was um, four years ago when I had that idea. I never imagined that Donald Trump would be president. I never imagined that uh, transgender troops would be banned from serving in the military. Um, I, I never imagined we'd have so many setbacks as a community. So we, we, we spend a lot of our time fighting for LGBTQ issues. Um, we're still not at a place uh, where we have lived equality. Um, you know, e equality might be the basement and justice is the ceiling. Like, uh, we, we have a, a long way to go um, inward and in, in working on our own rights. But at the same time, um, shouldn't we also be standing with immigrant populations? Um, and shouldn't we be standing with communities of color and the issues that they're facing and for women's rights and for disability rights and for workers' rights? And I personally believe that LGBTQ people should, um, especially those with more rights than others. And I say that and I'm thinking of like white, cisgendered gay men, mm. um, and I'm speaking as one, yeah. right? Like we don't face a ton of adversity when we walk out the front door because at the end of the day we're white male in america mm -hmm. and so i think it's important that we adopt values as a whole community that when one group of people is discriminated against that we will speak out for them uh we will speak out with them let me say it like that mm -hmm. and um so we, at burden of state equality we've been taking on some issues that historically an lgbtq organization might not but i think that's the values that we need to adopt as a community um and i'm proud to say that uh other state organizations have been following suit uh and doing the same and you know maybe a decade from now dustin or it might take more you know than that uh, the LGBT community will be known as a people that speak out against injustices anywhere, not just against themselves. Yeah. Well, that's an absolute beautiful message and sentiment. And it's, I've had the good fortune, um, a moment of personal privilege of knowing you for a number of years. And, uh, you know, the, the work you do is simply extraordinary. And, you know, the work of Garden State Equality, if uh, you're not convinced by the things that have been said here, um, I was going to ask about uh, your website and ways to learn more, but, um, you know, the, the things you do is, is simply miraculous. And whether it's Pride Month, no matter when it is a time of year, it's uh, an excellent organization to look into and to see what it is you do. And you stand up to many communities, not just uh, your own uh, different communities, of course. So um, with all that being said, um, you, well, actually, you look like you're about to say something, so I don't want to I don't want to take away. <laughs> Dustin, uh, you know, I just it's it's so great to be on a zoom call with someone who has made significant contributions uh on the lgbtq community and broader communities as well uh you know first of all thank you for your support of, of this organization and i know he's answering the call when we send out an ask um but also thank you personally for all of your contributions to society and everything that you do um, I'm really proud of you and, and we've known each other for a while. I'm proud of who you've become. Um, and, and it's so great to see you still serving your community at an organization like the Y. Um, you know, really, you're really grounded to what matters in life. And uh, this is the perfect role for you. And, and thank you for always speaking out uh, against injustices and, and being there when our community needs you. That means a lot coming from you, it really does. And uh, just uh, for our, our viewers, um, like I said, we've known each other for many years. And uh, like I said, it's it's just, it's a great honor to know Chris, and it really is. So, um, but going back, going back for a minute, um, just for anyone who wants to know about, um, let's say, programming events, um, things that are coming up from Garden State Equality, I want people to know where to go to and also if um, obviously every organization is dealing with challenges right now so if there's a way people can give back um, if there's opportunities uh, can you please let um, whoever's watching uh, know the information for us? yeah so uh, you can go to gardenstateequality.org 
please know that we are going to update our website soon. Um, it's in need of a little of a bit of a refresh, um, but you can go there. The information is is, is still relevant. Um, definitely follow Burden State Equality on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We're active on all of those sites daily, sharing important information about this community, especially within the, the New Jersey, New York City metropolitan area. Um, and it's a great way to stay informed and stay active. And, uh, you know, if you, if you follow us on Twitter or Instagram, we'll follow you back. Um, and uh, I appreciate you connecting with us on there. Fantastic. So um, is there anything you want to just say about Garden State Quality or anything going on before we, uh, we wrap it up? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about uh, what we're doing in, in response to COVID-19. Um, and I just encourage everybody out there, especially folks who, who might be struggling to, uh, to hold on. Uh, this will come to an end. Uh, it's, it's a rough time, not just for a state, not just for a nation, but for the entire world. And people understand uh, with what you're going through. You're not alone in your struggles. Um, and even though resources might not have arrived at your door yet, they will. I know a lot of folks who have applied for unemployment and they have not received it. It will take weeks. It will take months. Um, but it will come, and, there, and there's back pay there, um, and those resources will be made available to you. Uh, it is my hope that our elected officials will respond with another stimulus package. Uh, it's certainly necessary, especially for small businesses who are out there struggling, uh, who have had to keep their doors shut. But I have faith that resources will come. And today may be hard, but please have hope that uh, there is a light at the end of this tunnel. And uh, I hope you find solace in knowing that there's a lot of people feeling what you're feeling and you're not, you're not alone in this struggle right now. And, and if, and if, and if you need someone to talk to, there are, are a ton of resources out there. Just go on Google and look up hotlines, call a friend. You're def you're definitely not alone. I know that to be, I know that to be a fact. Uh, and so I just wanted to let everybody know, uh, you know, there's been some really hard weeks. I actually heard from a lot of folks uh, this past week, Dustin, that it was like, you know, people are, people are over it. People are uh, ready for this to end. And so uh, now more than ever, please know unemployment will come. Uh, resources will come and, and this will be over. Stay strong. Absolutely important message. Christian, I cannot possibly thank you enough for giving the time to speak to me and speak to um, obviously my viewers. And um, as always, if there's anything, please let us know. Um, but um, everybody, uh, Christian, uh, Executive Director of Garden State Quality, um, I'm just gonna sign off. So Christian, um, stay with me for a minute, but um, everyone else, I wanna wish you to stay safe, stay well, and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. And of course, um, happy uh, Pride Month. So we'll see you soon.